Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the great Teddy Atlas. Welcome to part two of How to Fix Boxing. We touched on a bunch of topics in the first episode on this topic, and um, today we're going to pick it up with uh, some other uh, su suggestions on how we can make the sport a little bit better. And um, before we start, I just want to pass along our condolences to... Um, Two fighters that we lost in the past uh, month or so, Max Dadashev, um, Russian fighter out of uh, Agus Clemens um, stable, a guy that um, Teddy, I know you've met in the past. He's uh, trained with Alex Vosdick and the and the boys out in Oxnard, and um, Hugo Alfredo Santian, Argentinian fighter, um, also passed away within about a week or two of Max, and it's a um, obviously tragic anytime we lose anyone in in any sporting endeavor but in, in particular combat sport and uh i know you have some thoughts on the topic yeah i mean as you said first we you know we continue to send our prayers out for those two fighters and their families and we're doing this show it, it would need to be done if they didn't if this didn't happen anyway because we understand the realism of the realities of this sport it's tough it's difficult it can be dangerous um we understand that we the same way as football race car driving those sports uh have the same sometimes the same perils or possible perils that are attached to it, the difficulties, the dangers that are attached to the sport. Um, so whether or not somebody had passed, we would still would be talking about things that make sense to talk about when you understand the sport and understand what you're dealing with, that there's always the possibility of somebody getting hurt because of the nature of the sport. But now with the passing of these two fighters, these two young people that had families and happened to be boxers. It's um, part of the tragedy of that is to try to respect them and remember them, you know, by, by seeing if you can hasten the change maybe, speed up the the ideas for the need for the change. Um, you know, no better way to tribute them than to say that we're going to make it a mandate. It should have always been a mandate, and I'm sure it is, but really make it a mandate now, a priority right now, you know, in a fastest way possible to look at how we can make this sport a little safer. I, listen, nothing, everything could be done right. We're not pointing fingers and things can still go wrong. Just like in a football game or any any sport that, you know, or M, MMA, UFC, any sport that is a combat sport, a physical sport, a football you could call it a combat sport. I think that's fair. Yeah. You know, um, you could do things right and things can still have the wrong end, the result that nobody wants. Again, because of the difficulty, the dangers that are inherent with the sport. But there are ways, always, to try to limit some of those dangers. And football's doing it. Why shouldn't we fault? Race car driving's doing it. You know, race car driving, they have roll bars that they didn't use to have in a car. They have an apparatus, because I did a fight plan years ago with ESPN in one of the race car drivers' car that he allowed me to go into his car, which usually is taboo. Mm -hmm. They never let you go in the car. And you know something about race yeah. car driving. You have friends that are race car drivers. So they they have an apparatus that stabilizes the spine and the neck uh, in case of an accident that right. was not invented until, unfortunately, somebody else died. Yep. Until somebody else was paralyzed, even though they understood the dangers of the sport before that, it it invokes action when something terrible, horrendous happens, and we're thinking 
about those things more so now in remembering these uh you know these two young warriors so football is always coming up with new protocol uh different helmets uh making the practices shorter, making uh, not allowing you to hit with pads uh, as long, limiting that, common sense stuff, you know, making sure hydration and things like that are understood properly, um, you know, uh, limiting the amount of preseason games, limiting the amount of hits that somebody takes, having a concussion protocol that years ago they didn't have, you know, that, that you don't get back on that field until you're cleared. That's where we can help ourselves with boxing because that's where we're still primitive. That's where we're still lacking. That's because we don't have a national commission to tie these things and to make sure these things are tied in, they're in place, and they're enforced. That's where we could get better. In in some of the medical areas, maybe. I'm not trying to be a neurologist, but let's talk to a neurologist. You know, uh, in a lot of the states with the commissions, we have all different independent commissions. We don't have unilateral medical conformity across the board, unfortunately. But some of it is the same. But in, in a lot of them, if you get knocked out, you got to get a CAT scan, an MRI. Why wait till a guy's knocked out? How about if he's in a tough fight and he took a lot of punishment? Get a CAT scan. He, he didn't get knocked out. So what? So what? And I'm not saying this would have. I am not saying this would have prevented these two young tragedies here. I'm just thinking ahead. I'm just thinking in a way that we need to think that maybe, you know, we understand what we understand, that it's a sport where there's physical damage that is handed out. So, and and it's to the head. Well, one of the things you just touched on was uniformity. In the case of the Argentinian fighter, um, Hugo Alfredo Santian, he... he was actually under suspension at the time in one area. I don't know if it was one area of the country, but he was definitely so under suspension. Should have been in the ring. Promoters should be held accountable for but that. But that's you what I'm put talking this about. Guy in the ring. He's got a we don't have injury. a national commission. We don't have any police. We don't have conformity. You just said it. Thank you for bringing that up, Ken. Because you hate to point fingers at when somebody dies, but from what you're saying, the guy shouldn't have been in the ring. 100%. So so, so right there, people say, Teddy, what's the answer? You know, sometimes there's not an answer. Sometimes there is an answer. That's one answer. That to make sure that there's unilateral conformity and accountability and across the board and regulation across the board, that if someone's suspended, he's suspended for a reason. Make sure he's not fighting somewhere. Not only Make, should he be not fighting anywhere, he shouldn't be but in the gym. He shouldn't be in the gym. But, you can't but let the, a kid spar. I mean, sparring can but be that's just as damaging. The, to the point with the football, a guy, there was a time when a guy got his bell rung, right? That's what they called it. Yep. Guy got his bell rung. He was concussed. And he was still playing. He was playing. He played in that game. He still played in the Not game. Not only playing, he was yeah. pressured to play. Well, even yeah. he might have some like, blurred vision and so all the right. symptoms. And and he was playing the following week. But now, because of the pressures, because of what we're talking about, the light put on it and everything else and all the problems with the NFL, with CDT, am I saying it? Uh, CTE. C- CTE, with all those problems and with all the medical, you know, checking and research that's being done on that, thank God. Uh, now there's a protocol. Now there's monitoring. Uh, a guy that got his bell rung, <clears throat> got concussed, is not playing in that game. He's not playing the following Sunday. Let me tell you something. A guy that gets his bell rung in, in boxing, he's playing the next Sunday. He's he's fighting in the next fight. M- worse than that, to what Ken just said, he's, he's in the gym. He's back in the gym. If there's somebody irresponsible, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry to – to uh, be the one, the bearer of this kind of news. But there are irresponsible people in football, in in, in life, in, in probably race car driving. Uh, you know, there's plenty of responsible ones. And in boxing, there's plenty of good ones, plenty of responsible ones. But there's some that aren't. Not, that, not necessarily that they're evil, but they're ignorant. Whatever it is, whatever it is, it, it can't be tolerated. Even because the sparring. It's, you because, go back and put a headgear on and take well, a bunch of shots it, that it, aren't it, it, going to stop you, but they're going to bang your brain around. See, that's where we can help this sport. That's what this episode is for. That's where something could be done, is that 
and that's why again we come back to a national commission to put the superstructure in place to to help these things happen because otherwise how do they happen they happen just with our thoughts just with our words just with our ideas no no so what i'm saying is that there was a time in football where a guy got his bell rung and he was playing again that time's gone because the NFL has a commission, there's pressure put on them, and now, and they did things wrong for money. Oh, yeah. For the evil root of money. They paid a lot of money oh, for that. But and they're no angels, but who at this point, who cares? All we care is about the football players are being protected. I care about, we care about the fighters are being protected. So now you have a situation where a guy who's been concussed, he's not back on the, forget about on Sunday, he's not back on that practice field until he's cleared. Yeah, That's where we can get better and much better and need to get much better in boxing because a guy could be suspended, and I guarantee you too often, more often than not, and too often and one time would be too much and it's more than one time, where a guy who's under suspension is back in that gym because he shows the signs that his trainer thinks he's okay and, you know, they they want to get ready for when the fight, when they're off suspension, they want to be ready to go. They don't want to be idle. They, they want to be able to fight right away. So during that time of suspension, they're in the gym boxing. There's only one way to fix that. You have to have monitoring, and it, there's monitoring in the NFL that there's nobody on the sidelines because if there are, that team will have not only a fine, that might not be a team anymore. I yeah. mean, that's how serious it has oh, yeah. to be dealt with right now. So it has to be the same serious repercussions where if a guy is caught in the gym, well, number one, the gym has their license taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. no playing with this stuff. Number two, the manager, who's the manager of the fighter, license taken. Not for a year, for life. Yeah. For life. All right? I have no problem being this severe when it comes to this stuff. The trainer, who's training, license taken away, like Panama Lewis, yeah. for life. For life. He's gone. He's out. No more. No more hearing. Nothing. Gone. Not six months. Not a year. Gone. So you have to get those kind of penalties in place, those kind of sanctions in place, that kind of, it, it's a severe sport. It's a severe consequence at the end. It's a severe reality. Make the punishment severe. Where there's monitoring, somebody goes around, you have to, you, again, you, you have to have with the commission, where if we had a national commission, where somebody goes around and makes sure that the guy on suspension is not training which, again, they are, is not training in the gym. It's not sparring in the gym during that time. And another thing I would put as a protocol, and again, without trying to be a doctor, it's common sense, some of it, right? We'll, yeah. get to, we'll check with the neurologist, of course. But where have a baseline where when you do the MRIs, too often, as I said earlier, unless a guy's knocked out, He's not getting an MRI. If he's knocked out, oh, you got to get an MRI. But if you're in a tough fight and you're not going to get an MRI. But even if you're not, make it where, regulate it where every two years, I'm just using an arbitrary yeah. number, you have to get a new CAT scan for baseline to see if there was change. Yeah, It makes sense to see if there's change. If there's change now, we're doing something proactive where we can see this change. Wait a minute, there's change here. So something's coming, something's happening before it happens. Yeah. So those are some of the things that can be done. That I, I, I tell you, there's good people out there, and I'm, I'm sure some of them are going to say, my God, how come they're not done? It is, it, it, it's so simple, it's so basic, it, it's, it's so common sense. It, 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 why aren't they done? So... That's why we're doing this episode, for for those things, for light to be shined on those things. And again, it, it's not something that you have to search far, near and far to to come up with. It, it's right there that those things can immediately and should probably be immediately implemented in a very difficult sport, a very dangerous sport. And I'll finish my thought with, you have to look beyond what you think is the obvious or see what the obvious is. 
you, and not take for granted that just what you saw that night in the ring was all that was at play. That was the only thing that was part of this tragedy. Mm-hmm. Point. Years ago, and there was a documentary made on this guy was a great fighter. The great Emil Griffith was involved in a fight, six-time middleweight champ, great fighter. God bless him, he's, he's not with us anymore. He was fighting Benny Kid Perrette. It was a fight, I think it was in the garden, but it doesn't really matter. It was a fight, and in the later rounds, it might have been the 11th round, they were in the corner, and Griffith had his hand behind Perrette in an area where the, the referee couldn't really see. You, it was hard to see. And he had his hand behind him a little bit and hit him an uppercut, a couple uppercuts, quite frankly. And everybody said, wow. In the aftermath of it, Kenny Kid Perrette, after that fight, went into a coma, cerebral hemorrhage, and he died. People said, and they jumped all over the referee, uh, who was a former great fighter, great referee. I think it was Ruby Goldstein. They jumped all over him. They said, oh, it was his fault. He's the reason why the fighter died because and got hurt because he, he, he allowed, he didn't see, and he allowed by not seeing, he allowed Griffith to hold him and hit him where the head would naturally give. It wasn't able to naturally give, and therefore, the impact of the punch was exaggerated. Mm-hmm. And that caused it. <clears throat> For somebody who's looking to grab something, I guess it sounds plausible. But no. What they didn't look at was that a few months earlier, I don't know if it was two, three months, Perrette was in a fight with a bigger, stronger guy who had been, a, I don't know if he had been or still was, but a tremendous, a tremendously strong, bigger middleweight who was a world champion, one of the strongest physical fighters probably in the history of the sport, Gene Farmer from Utah. You know, they talk about country strong. Mm. That was that was Farmer, country strong. And he fought everybody. And this is a physical, strong brute. And he's in there with a smaller Perrette. I don't know if it was three, four months earlier. And from all counts, Perrette took a terrible beating. A terrible beating at the hands of Fulmer. And three months later, four months later, whatever it was, he's in the ring. I would say that that's got to be looked at. Mm -hmm. That he shouldn't have been so quickly allowed to be back in the ring after that kind of beating. He should have been examined more. More space should have been given before he got back in the ring. If he got back in the ring. At that level. So those are the things that we have to be cognizant of. Those are the things that we have to be aware of. There's Emil Griffith. There's a great gene. 1962 form. in the yeah. garden. Yeah, now, now, yeah. now we, want, we want Griffith with Perrette. And uh, this is Perrette, I guess, right? I'm not seeing the name. Yeah, the name, I mean... You have to go down. So he fought. No, the the up top. I mean the so name. So this is where he fought Emil yeah. Griffith. He fought Gene. No, Fulmer. I just want to see Perrette. So he fought uh, yeah, him three months yeah, later. Yeah, just so we. I want to see the man. Yeah. Yeah, Benny Kid Perrette. So he fought him three months later after he took the beat in a. Yeah, Fulmer. go back to the record. No, go back to the record. Let's look at it. Can you take it? So he fought him in. Um, he fought Emil Griffith in March March twenty fourth of sixty two, and he took the beating to Fulmer in uh, December. December 9th of 61. So you're talking like three plus months, but still three months after getting a severe concussion. It's not enough time. No. Okay, uh, look, listen, are we, am I saying anything definitive? Am I trying to be that guy? No, I'm not. I'm just talking about all we can talk about, possibilities. In terms of a It's possible that he get hurt in that fight. Oh, and, I'll t- sure. and I'll leave one other thing. After that fight, because it was what happened, Years later, there was a documentary done about it with Amy Griffith. They, they thought it was called Ring of Fire. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. But they did a documentary on it. And there was, things came out, and that's usually the case with a tragedy, right? Mm-hmm. Things come out you didn't know about. Yeah. Because if you knew about it, maybe you prevent the tragedy. Yeah. Let's know about it. Mm-hmm. 
let's know about it. Things came out where apparently he had been complaining, Perret had been complaining since the former fight of headaches. Yeah. Severe headaches. Not feeling good. Nauseous. Headaches. I don't feel good. To the point where he actually had asked for the fight to be postponed. Yeah. But his managers, his the promoters, you know, that are thinking about what they're thinking about said, you can't. No, it's a TV fight. Uh, I can't be postponed. No. Too much money at stake. Uh, you know, you can't just get fights like this. You can't just get dates like this. You know? Well, guess what? Sometimes you have to forget about those things because you can't get a second chance in life either. Yeah. A, a modern in, uh, an incident that happened in more modern times uh, or more recent times is um, the incident with Antonio Margarito when he uh, lumped up Cotto when they found he was found or suspected to have like uh, some kind of cast inside of his glove. Do you remember that fight? Yeah. What Cotto's face looked like after that fight? Oh. And then Cotto eventually came back, I think, and beat him up. But can you imagine that, that someone would allow this guy to fight after doing that to someone, being accused of doing that? And then, you know... Within a couple of years, he's back in the ring fighting again to, to, to knowingly do that. It speaks to the lack. It speaks to what we're talking about, what we've been talking about since the the morning of the, the genesis of this show, mm -hmm. when we need to talk about it, right? Yeah. It speaks to the lack of culpability in this sport, the lack of accountability, the lack of enforcement, the lack of policing. The lack of seriousness mm -hmm. when it comes to such things. So I think that, you know, we wanted to do justice while we're thinking about these two young men to try to talk about things that can be things that could be implemented possibly to help in some areas. And we don't have the answers, all the answers mm -hmm. to what happened to these two young men. But we have one of them that you provided by giving us the information that he was under suspension. He shouldn't have been in the ring. Yeah. The kid from Argentina. Yep. So, that I mean, that's all you need to know with that. In terms of solutions, what are your thoughts on the um, hydration rule and the weigh-ins? Like one of the things that they do in one of the MMA outfits in uh, Asia, one fighting championship, is they have the weigh-ins. I want to say the day be the day of the fight, but more importantly, when you go to weigh-in, they take a urine sample, and if your your hydration level is below a certain level, I'm not sure what the exact scientific. Uh, Re rationale but basically if you you know you can tell how dehydrated someone is from the urine if you're beyond a certain level of dehydration you're out you miss weight so yeah. people are fighting at their natural weights yeah and you, that's how well, they test it here's my answer here's my answer again there's a lot of ways to look at those things and one quick thing yeah, okay. joey gamach is a good example of what can happen with those severe weight cuts he fought um arturo Gotti in his in his last um fight joey's last fight and they weigh in the day before the fight the morning before the fight so you know what's about 36 hours before the fight arturo Gotti, you know following the rules weighs in the night of the fight at like i want to say like 24 pounds above where he weighed in he hit Joey Gamach with some shots, almost killed him. They took him out in a stretcher. Joey Gamach never fought again. V scary. I was there. It was a scary knockout. Oh, I remember. And get, yeah. And then it brought lawsuits and it it brought changes to those rules yeah. too, you know, which it should. But some of those changes maybe we would wish could be made before you have a situation like that because it makes with, sense to look at them when you dehydrate like that to weigh in you're not just dehydrating your body your brain is also losing important critical hydration protective measures that doesn't that come back yeah, exactly not overnight and the brain has less protection yep. the next night that's right the, here's my there's no clear answer you want to talk to the medical people but also Sometimes you want to talk to people that are just in the business that understand, you know, it's that old saying, you know, it passes this test, it passes this test, but does it pass the eye test? Yep. You know, sometimes that's the best test, the common sense, the eye test. And you you see what happens. You see how these fighters are affected when they are out of their weight classes. So here's my answer to the best that I can and be honest about it, about things that we really don't know definitively find a way and there's a way 
to calibrate these guys, their muscle, everything, and be able to find out and the, whether it's the commission's responsibility or if we had a national commission, it would just be the rule across the board that you find out what the proper weight class the fighter should be fighting at. For me, that's that's the best answer. Yeah. Is that because a lot of these guys think they're getting an advantage. They're ignorant too, some of the trainers. They don't know. Yeah. But they think in the amateurs I see. Do you know how many kids I used to see years ago in the amateurs that were taking latex? They were they were taking urine pill to, to urinate. Laxatives. So, laxatives and I think latex was one of them. But um but they were they it wasn't just laxative. This was a urinating pill to, to dry out. Like a water uh, pill, yeah. yeah, water pill. Uh to make weight. You know how many kids I saw sticking their fingers down? And I'm talking about sixteen year old kids, fifteen year old kids, fourteen year old kids, uh seventeen year old kids, eighteen year old kids, uh, sticking their fingers in the toilet to make weight because they didn't understand the proper way of nutritionally, the proper way, you know, to to make weight. Nobody taught them. Nobody taught their trainers. So they didn't know the proper weight. And the trainers thought they were having an advantage by by fighting at a lower weight because they would know that, but they did. They, you have to understand the mentality because you're in a pressure business. You're in a fear business. You're in a, you're in a, in a, a, a muscle business, a fight business, a tough business. So you're looking for an advantage, just like some people look for the needle. They look, you know, mm -hmm. for the for the steroid. And so back in those days, there was really no availability probably of steroids to that level. So, so in their own little world, you know, and in ignorance of it, the trainers would say, if I – Bring my kid who's a lightweight, let's say, and I bring him down to featherweight. He'll be stronger than he'll be stronger than featherweights, rather than understand he's undermining the kid and he's weakening the yeah. kid. And that there's other repercussions. I saw these kids. I'm not going to use a name, but I know a couple of them that they their trainers did this. And they did it for years to win the Golden Gloves, to win amateur tournaments, to go in the nationals. And they did it for years. They they restricted their growth process by not letting them eat properly, that by keeping the weight down to, so they could fight in a lower weight class. And the kid physically never grew into what the kid was nature meant for him to grow into. The kid stayed skinny. This kid stayed unphysical. This kid stayed weak. He he wasn't strong. He he might have won with his experience and everything else. He might have won some tournaments. Maybe maybe he had an advantage in certain areas. But as time went on, he was he wasn't having an advantage of being stronger. Because when the body was neglected, when the body was not given the nutriment that it needed to grow to what it was supposed to grow to, it didn't grow. So the body never developed to where it was supposed to develop. So the kid, when you saw that 16-year-old kid when he was 20, 21, he was, he was less physical than, than other kids at 21, less, less strong, and, and it stayed with him. And there was a price, and that was the price. Some of these kids were ruined. Yeah. So because of what I just described. So there has to be... Clinics, Lasix, I was right. Yeah. I, I knew that uh, I that, that was what they used to take. That was the thing that a lot a diuretic, of people would, yeah. yeah, it was a diuretic to, to urinate and to, to lose the weight. And a lot of, like I'm saying, what can be done is clinics can be run. Uh, these trainers can be educated of the proper way to to lose weight, yeah. you know, and to understand, again, uh, even in the pro ranks, you know, the mentalities there. Like some guys think that, hey, if I got a middleweight, but I, I make them fight at welterweight or let's say junior middleweight, um, I, I have an advantage. So they need to be, a couple things needs to be done. One, they need to be educated, but some people don't want to be educated. Yeah. I understand that already. So you got to, what you have to do is, have as part of Make the it part of the licensing part of the licensing part of the of all of that that process uh, is that you find out you you find out what weight you go through the exam you go through the testing that will tell what weight a fighter and he's stamped when he's licensed that 
he's a middleweight. In other words, he yeah. can't turn into a welterweight because somebody gets the brilliant idea that we're going to go without eating for a week and we'll become a welterweight. No, uh, the doctors, whatever test it is, you know, sometimes they weigh you in uh, in water. They weigh you. That's in That's uh, basically what the hydration test in uh, that they use in a one fighting championship does. It basically is the equivalent of weighing you in the water. It's weighing how much of as a percentage water weight do you have and if it's below a certain weight you're out period what do you do what i say is again you do that you do that when they get their license and you know exactly what weight they're supposed to be at yeah and so now you've eliminated some of the problems we just talked about mm -hmm. because they're not they're not going to be coming in dehydrated they're not because they're going to be fighting at the proper weight right at a weight that god meant them nature meant them what do you think about what do you think about the discussion i've heard this uh mentioned in a few different uh arenas um smaller gloves shorter rounds whereas a smaller glove instead of taking sustained damage if you get hit hard enough with a good shot you go down kind of like the ufc if you get dropped there and you're in trouble you're not let you're not given 10 seconds to recover and then take more punishment and more punishment once you get dropped it's not necessarily knocked down and it's over but you can tell if someone gets knocked down and like, okay, good shot. I'm going to be. I don't want guys getting hit with harder shots. I get the thought of the merit to that. I yeah. get it. Kind of like I don't when they eliminated it. the headgear in the uh, Olympics. A lot of the damage can be done accumulatively. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I get it. I'm not going to dismiss the thought of that. Mm -hmm. But what I am going to say it. I don't believe in smaller where the guy gets hit a harder punch where he can feel the fist more. You know, I'm just being exaggerative just to make the point where he can feel the flesh and bone where the flesh and bone is closer to the guy's face now and there's less padding to to insulate it from the guy's chin um, where he gets hit a, a harder punch and and meanwhile he get hurt in a fight, maybe get stopped uh, sooner no because there's still more impact to that there's yeah. still uh, there, there's still a price to pay for that greater impact what i'd rather do is rather than go that route i would rather go the route where we do we do a better job of making sure this is a difficult one but because I don't want to ruin the sport because some people are going to say, well, then you eliminate. It's like Duke can't always play North Carolina. You know, they can't always play uh, against USC or Gonzaga. Sometimes they got to play Prairie View. <laughs> and so some people say, well, Teddy, you can't eliminate guys that are lesser fighters because those opponents are part of the game. They're right. They're right. But there's a fine line here. Of responsibility. Not everyone should be a fighter. Maybe we can do a little bit better job in two areas. And I'm being very careful saying this because it's probably never been said. Before you license a fighter, before you license a race car driver, don't you have to show the prerequisite skills to handle that car at 200 miles an hour? Yep. Okay. Before you license a fighter, Find a way. I know it's difficult. I know that. I understand. To make sure that he has some of the prerequisite skills to make sense to be doing this. That if you throw 10 punches, he don't get hit with 10. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the trainers. You know, you don't, you don't just hand out a driver's license to anybody. Why? Because it's not a right, it's a privilege. It, there's a responsibility attached to that license. You could kill somebody if you don't know how to drive. Well, guess what? You could you could be part of somebody getting hurt, maybe killed if you don't teach them right as a trainer. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I'm just saying. So, and there's nothing attached to that with these fights. I'm just I'm saying over where we're going deep yeah. before this that before you just hand out a license to some of these trainers can they should they be training a fighter do they have the understanding the the knowledge the teaching the ability the responsibility the nature to be able to train a fighter mm -hmm. 
Do they? I can answer that. I can answer that. I am in a position to answer that. A lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. And you don't see them. They're in these little gyms off in different places, and they might be good guys, some of them. Really. And there's so many of them that do have the ability to do that. But we can't be guessing at it. Yeah. Those guys need to be licensed. And before you license them, there needs to be a way to see if they should be licensed, to judge them. Same thing with the fighters. Yep. No, I agree. It's a, um, what are your thoughts on the shorter rounds? You know, we already went from 15 to 12. Mm -hmm. I think that, again, if a guy's taking too much punishment, we don't, whether it's 15, 20 rounds, if he's taking, it does to me, if he's taking too much you. punishment, stop the fight. Yeah. You know, I, you, there is a fine line between making the sport safer and eliminating the sport. Yeah. Because if you put headgears on, some people, and they don't help. Mm -hmm. I talk to neurologists, do not help. Mm -hmm. Do not help. Yeah. But, some people used to talk, well, maybe you should put, hey, well, then there's no more professional boxing. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to come and watch uh, boxing. Again, we like to talk honesty, right? Mm -hmm. they, you're eliminating the uh, the industry. Yeah. There will not be fun. But if that's what you had to do, fine. But it's not the answer. Neurologists have told me, oh, no, 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 that does not help. Does not at all. So maybe it helps with cuts, possibly, possibly. Where, but if it's not fitted right, sometimes it moves and causes a cut. Yeah. But but it can help with cuts possibly, but with headbutts, stuff like that. But as far as the concussive effect of a blow hitting your skull, no. Well, I think the Olympics already determined that they, well, they did let's that get it rid doesn't of them. it doesn't give you any medical help right. uh, in those areas. But what I'm saying is, if you had Edgar, there'd be no more industry for pro boxing. If if you continue to, you don't have those championship rounds, so to speak. Yeah, twelve rounds. You're going to um, diminish. You're going to diminish the. You're going to hurt the sport. As far as from a point of fans that are supporting it and coming out for the big fights, the mm -hmm. championship fights. Yeah. You know, but they want to see you. People want to see the AFC championship. Yeah. They want to see the NBA finals. They want to see the Super Bowl, uh, you know, because that that's why they watch during the season to see who's going to get to the Super Bowl. Yep. People will watch during the season in 10-round fights, but they want to see who gets to the Super Bowl. Yep. Who's going to get to the championship round. So uh, if that was the answer, I'd say, okay. But – that has not been shown to be the answer. Uh, I mean, it, can you? Does it make common sense? Common sense that some guys are more tired and tw going twelve than they, and and more vulnerable than ten. Common sense that, that if they're more tired, maybe they're more susceptible. Well, then, then when you get to ten, you might say, well, then if you could go only eight. Yeah, it'll be there'll be a little, slippery slope. It is a slippery slope. It is a slippery slope. But there's other things that I think come before that. Mm -hmm. The things we're talking about. Yeah, that come before that. You know that you're looking at a, you're looking at a guy, you know, and you're saying, is he, is he qualified to go twelve rounds? That's a good point. Well, listen, this is all part of an uh, ongoing dialogue, and what we're hoping to do is stimulate conversation, stimulate debate, solicit feedback from the fans, always trying to make the sport better and, uh, you know, talk about things that maybe aren't being talked about in the mainstream uh, boxing media. Um, but, yeah, like I said, we'd love to hear some feedback. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Teddy, before we wrap this one up? No, just, just where we started this episode with is uh you know you know our, our hearts you know we are broken like every other person in this business when you see somebody hurt somebody somebody die yeah. um in this sport and we saw that in the last three weeks the last month 
And um, that's why we're talking about it. And again, we send out our prayers to those two fallen fighters. Yep. So, guys, if you like the show, please let us know what your thoughts and uh, opinions are. I'm sure there won't be any shortage. And, um, you know, to the extent that the feedback is there and the um, opinions are there, we'll continue to um, discuss these topics. So, please share your thoughts in the comments section. And um, thanks for being with us. Teddy, thanks for your thoughts. And uh, good to be with you guys. Look forward to the next one. Start to eat our-